Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to Trinity today for worship. We have a few announcements we'll, we'll have before we begin. I invite you to turn to your bulletins on the inside page. There's a lot to read there, so I hope that you'll go over that and particularly pay attention to those that apply to your uh, interests and desires. But I do want to highlight a few of them. Uh, the second one in, in the, at the beginning there is about our cont contribution statements, and they are in the gathering area. If you haven't picked your box up and uh, your contribution statements, we invite you to get that. We'll be mailing out the rest of them this week. So if you haven't gotten it, pick it up and save us a stamp. We'd appreciate it. Uh, and then a little further down, there's a fishing opportunity on Tuesday. Greg Jenkins has invited youth and children with their parents to come and uh, learn a little bit about basic beginning fishing at the subdivision where he lives, and that information is there for this Tuesday. Appreciate Greg offering that opportunity and some others uh, I'm sure will be helping him out. Uh, I'll be speaking this Tuesday at First Baptist Madison for their Lenten luncheon, and you're welcome to attend that if you'd like to. And then I want you to note the baptism we'll have in two weeks on the 29th for Nicholas Cooley. Uh, we'll have the baptism there. That's also Palm Sunday. It begins Holy Week for us, and it's Children's Sabbath. So be uh, particularly praying about Nicholas's baptism, but also the wonderful opportunity we have to worship during the season uh, of Lent as it concludes through Holy Week. And then uh, one other uh, announcement is on the TBC Kids side on the right there, Passport Kids Information Meeting. That's this Wednesday. If you or your kid are interested in camp, please uh, meet with Amy on Wednesday. Thank you for being in worship today. Let's begin with a time of greeting. So I invite you to stand as we pass the peace. <clears throat> Thank you for gathering for worship today in our sanctuary. What a beautiful day it is. It was nice to see the sunshine finally poking away those clouds. And I hope today you will feel the warmth and the light of Christ as we gather in his name to worship. Let's gather now as we worship. No one should ever have to be alone. I was lonely until I met Jesus. Ask anyone, they'll tell you. I was a different and better person after I met Jesus. I was never to have been so bold as the day that I poured wine, I mean, as I poured perfume on Jesus' head. I could tell that Jesus was going to die. Couldn't anyone else? Didn't they care? His own followers were so wrapped up in their own goals for the future that they couldn't see what Jesus was going to have to go through alone. Jesus was going to die, and somebody needed to anoint him. No one should ever have to be alone. Jesus took me when I was at my lowest, and Jesus can do the same for you. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we have gathered here today to worship in your house, and we give thanks for your many blessings in our lives. We now ask that you be a part of our worship service, that you allow your spirit to be among us, and that all that we do and say is pleasing in your sight. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us now sing together our hymn of invocation, hymn number 279, O Master, Let Me Walk With Thee. Please stand as we sing together.
seated. Over the past several weeks, we have been going through a series during our Be Still in No Time in which we meditate on our core values that we have recently um, developed as a church body. And this week we continue that series by meditating on the value that we value authenticity. I invite you to please join me in reading the litany found printed in your worship order. Just as one body, though one, has many parts, all its parts form one body. Now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? God has given each of us unique talents, unique skills, and a unique role to play in the body. It is here that we gather together to be our authentic selves, to be the body of Christ, to tell our stories together. We value open inquiry and a genuine desire to learn more about God. We are comfortable being ourselves in our faith journey, allowing us to share God's love in approachable and believable ways. Let us pray. God of grace and God of glory, you have blessed each of us here today with a special set of skills and talents and abilities so that we might play a unique, special, and vital role in the body of Christ. Bless us that in this hour together we might come to better understand what our role is and how we might fully live into that role so that we might become the authentic people you would have us to be so that we might then turn and by the power of your Holy Spirit go out and serve as the body in the world around us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning is from the third chapter of Philippians, uh, 12 through 16, and I'll be reading from the message. I'm not saying that I have this all together, that I have it made, but I'm well on my way reaching out for Christ, who so wondrously, wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all of this, but I've got my eye on the goal, where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. I'm off and running, and I'm not turning back. So let's keep focused on that goal, those of us who want everything God has for us. If any of you have something else in mind, something less than total commitment, God will clear your blurred vision. You'll see it yet. Now that we're on the right track, let's stay on it. At this time, our pre-K and kindergartners are invited to exit for children's worship as we sing together our hymn of calling, hymn number 389, to worship, work, and witness. Please stand as we sing together. Please be seated. Hello, I'm Jody Bowhay, and I'm here to share with you about sowing seeds of hope in Perry County, Alabama. Uh, God is about relationships with us, and so missions is about building relationships with others to help them to see God. In Perry County is one of the poorest counties in America. And Alabama CBF decided about 10 years ago that they would invest uh, 25 years in Perry County to try to make a difference there. Sowing Seeds of Hope is the organization that works there in Perry County. And they offer health services to the residents, um, help uh, to obtain jobs, and help with their homes. And we as Trinity have gone there and done projects each year. Uh, we do specific projects like uh, we've helped um, doing some construction in church, in a church, and uh, private homes, and also lately in the elementary school there. Uh, 
One of the hopes that we have with the elementary school is that the residents will take pride in their school and it will encourage the kids in the education because they are the future of the county. Uh, when, you give, when you give to missions uh, at Easter or any other time, your money goes to an organization like Sowing Seeds of Hope that is actually there in Perry County. And they're building relationships with the people there and they give an opportunity to churches like us and churches that are all around the area to be able to go and partner with the people there to make a difference. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 7 about sowing seeds, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he, knew plant, neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. Let's take a moment to pray silently for Perry County. Amen.
We've had such good worship today. I think that's going to be one of my favorites that you guys do. Thank you for sharing that and a heart of praise this morning. Uh, Cassie, and I got to hear on the flute. We'll hear later on the, his eyes on the spare. I love that song. Great job. Thank you all. I never uh, heard anything about a lady named Mary Godfrey until I was reading an article, oddly enough, about uh, a subway station, a rail that they were putting in in London, England. They call it the tube, I guess, if you've been over there. So they're putting in this new line for the subway system there called Crossrail. And it happens to run through an old cemetery. And that cemetery belonged to the oldest uh, and the first psychiatric hospital in Europe. Originally called the Bethlehem Royal Hospital. Later, some people called it Bethlehem. And from that, notoriously, the name Bedlam comes from. And in the Bedlam Cemetery from the 1500s to the 1700s, these mass burials occurred. Over 20,000 people were buried, sometimes because of great illnesses that swept through. There were people who were just buried on top of each other. So there are all these graves there. And so they're doing this archaeological dig, and they've identified these graves. And one of them, uh, just a little nameplate, is all we have of this woman named Mary Godfrey, who died in 1655 when a plague went through London. So many people died, and there were several people buried in that same spot. It made me wonder about Mary. Did her life matter? Did her life have meaning? Who was she? Whose daughter was she? Was she married? Did she have children? Was she happy? Uh, what was her favorite color? Was Mary a person that mattered? From the beginning, humans have asked questions about our existence here. And we're going through a series of sermons thinking about some of the questions that most humans at some point in their lives have asked about their existence. And today we're going to talk about the question of, what, can my life have meaning? Do I matter? Why am I here? And as we go through this, these questions have to do with our purpose. And long before Rick Warren wrote his book, The Purpose Driven Life, people have been asking that question. What's my purpose? Paul, in the passage that we heard read so well to us earlier, Paul says, uh, I have this goal, I have this purpose, and I'm striving toward it. I'm running toward it. I love that version that Lizette read to us from. When I was in college at the Baptist Campus Ministry, I remember the question for us at that time was similar. It was, what is God's will for my life? How can I discover God's purpose or God's will for me? Can life have meaning? And that question is something that we will visit over and over again, if we're honest, won't we? No matter how old we are, we'll come back to that question periodically. Am I here for a purpose? Is there meaning to my life? Am I mattering? Do I matter in this world? Mark Twain famously said, the two most important days of your life are the day you're born and the day you find out why. In the Bible, one of the ways that people tried to get a grasp on understanding their significance was in a time before there was any real great concept of life after death in the Old Testament. Their concept was the land, the land theology that they developed. So you could have your family name. You would continue on, in a sense, by keeping the land that God had promised and given to your family intact. So they would leave it, of course, to the oldest son, but with provisions that it not be subdivided out or sold. That was at least the goal of the idea, but it was less than satisfying to them. One of the first people in Scripture who really questions life's meaning is a preacher or teacher, a preacher, who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. This is how Ecclesiastes begins. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Makes you want to go out and read that book today, doesn't it? The King James Version, the one I learned when I was growing up, is more poetic. It says, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Now, by the end of that book, if you can stick through it with some of the great poetic words of our scriptures, you'll come to the conclusion, as the preacher does in that story, in that book, he says simply this, the end of the matter is fear God and keep God's commandments. Every Christian, every great Christian, has talked about periods of time in their lives when they have this question. Am I making a difference? Does my life have meaning? Does it matter? Sometimes they describe long distances of time when they feel like they can't find any clarity to that answer. They call it sometimes the dark night of the soul. 
One great Christian preacher said this, I spent several months of my life on the sloping back of a question mark. Maybe you've asked that question about your own life before. I want you to know that in the Bible where we will go for our answers and trying to seek understanding, the Bible tells us that we all matter. We matter. Our life has meaning to God. You matter. That's a very important thing for us to know. But as you seek to try to find answers to that question for your own life, one of the things the Bible does is to ask us to first look at our hearts. What's there? What's in our hearts? Out of our hearts, our true selves will emerge. The true meaning, maybe, of our lives. You remember the story of the anointing of the great King David, the second king of Israel, but maybe the greatest of all. David is a little shepherd boy, the eighth son of Jesse. Samuel the prophet goes down in this transition time in Israel's history looking for a king. And Jesse parades eight great sons, seven sons before him. And each one, Samuel, looking with worldly eyes, says, this will be a great choice. I think this guy would make a great king. But God, you remember, says, no, there's something more. Because I look at a person's heart. That's where I will judge their worthiness, their fitness for the purposes that I have for them. So they find this shepherd boy, the eighth son, the unlikely one, who is David, who will be the king. What's in our heart matters to God. Because what's in our heart will eventually affect the way we behave and how we present ourselves in this world. You know, one of the, the guys that I think was probably the toughest old codger I've ever dealt with in church life was a guy who just could not be happy. He couldn't find anything really to be completely satisfied with in church. Now, the guy was at church every Sunday, always sat in the pews. He did stuff, but he couldn't do happy. <laughs> he had a hard time with it. He was one of those guys that could find the cloud in every silver lining. You may know people like that. We'd have Christmas for people or kids particularly who were disadvantaged. We'd collect these toys. He'd find something wrong with it. We would raise food, you know, do a food drive for the food pantry or for whatever, and he'd find a problem. We'd have Youth Sunday. There'd be something wrong with Youth Sunday. He just could not be happy. He had a problem with so many things. And so I'd look, I got to where I would look to see if we could see to make him smile. I'd look for a smile, but he was really good at hiding it. So finally, one day I came to Charles and I said, what's going on? What's going on with you? Why are you this way? And he, he told me several things. And one of the things he opened up about, he said, when I was a kid, I went to this little Baptist church, and we had, a, we had a business meeting one night. And during the business meeting, there was a lot of contention. And there was a, finally a vote taken, a decision made. But it was summertime, and it was warm, and the days were longer. So there were people who still didn't like the result of that vote. So out in the parking lot, they continued the discussion. And he said, as a kid, I was standing around. There was a group of people, including some men who were deacons, and I heard their anger. And I knew they were mad, and I heard one of the deacons cuss. And he said, that has disillusioned me. So he has this love-hate relationship with church to this day. And I want you to hear that because in our hearts, whatever is in our hearts, it will come out. And the people that we will probably influence the most will be the youngest. The littlest, the least, maybe our own children. They will learn what it means to have faith, what church means, by what's in our hearts. They will learn by our hearts. So likewise, if you have a, a heart that is loving, that is gracious, that has honest faith that comes out over and over again, you have the possibility to have incredible meaning and influence on the lives of our youngest. So whether you realize it or not, or whether you want it or not, your life has meaning. And particularly to the youngest, most impressionable ones around us. So God says, pay attention to the condition of your heart. Pray and ask God to do the shaping work that God has to do on a daily basis in your heart and in mind. Because our hearts will impact the people who are closest to us. And that's where the Bible begins. When thinking about the meaning of our lives. Because who we are in our hearts will come out. And it will influence somebody. There's a great catechism or a teaching of the church that says the chief purpose of all people is to honor or glorify God and to enjoy God forever. To honor and glorify God. You know, in the Bible, there's a lot of history. 
And in that history, there are stories of these great kings. And by world standards, some of these kings were extremely successful. They had building projects. They expanded the borders of the nation. They brought in money to the treasury. The, the highway system improved. The politics, they excelled in all those measures. But some of those who by worldly standards were great kings, the Bible says, were bad kings. Because the Bible uses one judgment for the quality of the life of these kings. And that is, did this king's life glorify and honor God? Did you honor God with your life? You remember what the writer of Ecclesiastes said? In the end, it's this, fear God and keep the commandments. The news anchor Dan Rather, who served for such a long time presenting us the evening news, said that he had a way of keeping his professional objective always before him so he could remember why he was doing what he was doing. And he wrote it down, a little question on a piece of paper. He kept it in his billfold, one in his pocket, one on his table there at the news desk. And the question was simply this, is what you are doing now helping the broadcast? That's a good question for us to ask too. Of our lives, is what you're doing now honoring God? The way you're living, the way you speak, the things you do, is your life honoring God? Helping the broadcast, not the broadcast, but the kingdom of God. Is what you're doing contributing to the advancement of God's kingdom? You know, I go to a lot of these meetings where there's bunches of Baptist preachers around, so please pray for me. So we get in all these meetings, these assemblies and these conventions and stuff, and we get these badges, these name tags. So it'll have Mike Oliver, Trinity Baptist Church, Madison, Alabama, or whatever, you know. And everybody's got these badges, and we have this meeting. And then when the meetings are over, we have these breaks. You know, preachers can sniff out all these good restaurants in town. So people have these mad dashes. After the meetings, we're going to hit these great restaurants. And, and it's always gotten me, some of, these, some of these preachers, you know, they keep the badges on. I take mine off when the meeting's on. I don't think the folks at the restaurant care if I'm a Baptist preacher or not. They don't want to see my badge. And so you'll see these folks walking down the street with their badges, going into the restaurant with their badges, and I've sort of always made fun of that a little bit. But what if we all wore badges for a while that said, I'm a follower of Jesus? And we went out into the world, go to school or work or the restaurants or whatever you do to your home. You coach, you teach, whatever you do. And you had that little thing on there that says, I am a follower of Jesus. It might bring some clarity to us. It might help us remember what we're supposed to all be about. The meaning we're supposed to have in life. Because we get to be, for some people, the only Jesus they get to see at all. What we do, what we say, how we act is a direct reflection on our Lord. Maybe it's good to have that little badge. Maybe keep something with us as a reminder to give us clarity about that. Ask yourself this question, is what I'm doing now bringing honor to God? Is the way I'm living advancing the cause of a loving and gracious God? When people look at me, what do they think about Jesus? In the New Testament, there's a story of Jesus who is observer, a great observer of life. And he observed us, all people. And one day he's watching as people are going to the treasury at the temple and they drop their money in for the offering time. And he sees this old lady who's a widow. And she drops in what is equivalent to less than a penny into it. It's called a widow's mite. I actually bought an authentic one. They told me it was uh, in Israel. It's probably just a piece of tin. They could have sold me anything. I got this widow's mite to remind me of that story. Jesus noticed this little, seemingly little contribution. But to Jesus, he says, it was the most valuable gift given that day. That small thing mattered so much. Jesus noticed little things. The Jesus who told us about even mustard-sized faith, small faith, could make a tremendous difference in the world. Who welcomed children who have very little value in that day and time and said, of such is the kingdom of God. Now, I want to stop here and say... Before I talk about small things, I want to challenge you to think about big things. To think about big things that you might do to advance the cause of God's kingdom. And I want to tell you the story of a guy named William Carey, who's always sort of been a hero of mine. Probably you know about him. William Carey is known as the father of the modern missions moment, movement. William Carey in the 1700s, late 1700s, early 1800s, was a shoe cobbler. Just a simple guy. And as he was working on shoes, he made a leather map of the world. 
And as he worked on his shoes that customers brought in, he would pray over that mouth, praying for all the peoples of the world to come to a knowledge of salvation in Jesus Christ, to pray that they would hear about our Lord. And so at that time, Baptists didn't send missionaries out. It's a very strange time. Didn't send missionaries out. And he went to one of these, these Baptist preacher meetings with the badges. And he went in there and he stood up and he said, Isn't it time that we start spreading the gospel? Sharing the gospel by sending missionaries out into the world. And famously, one old preacher said this, Young man, sit down. When God pleases to convert the heathen, he will do it without your aid or mine. So young William sat down that day, but not for long, because he had a passion in his heart, and he wouldn't stay seated long. In fact, there came a day when he got behind the pulpit to preach to that group, and he had a great sermon, and with these powerful words, he said, expect great things from God, also attempt great things for God. You and I should expect and hope for great things for God in our lives. But as we're expecting all those things from God, we are also called to attempt great things for God in this world. So one of the things that we can do if we want to have meaning, our lives want to have meaning, is to not take baby steps, but take some leaps of faith in your life. Do something, attempt something, in the name of Jesus that is so big and so powerful that if it works, you know God had to be a part of it because there's no way you could have done it by yourself. There's no way any human could have done it. It had to be something God could do. Every life ought to have at least one attempt great things for God moment in it. But most of us, on a daily basis, won't have big opportunities like that. We will have, on a daily basis, small things that we can do. Things that God notices, things that matter, that add up over time to make our lives a meaningful life. I remember the story I read some time ago of a lady named Miss Alma, who was the Sunday school director at her little church. And for over 30 years, she was in her 90s, for over 30 years, she was the lady that would go around. I don't know if you know about this on Sunday school, but we, we keep rolling. We keep rolling Sunday school, and there's a little sheet of paper that we fill out whoever's present that day, and then they'll put it outside the door of your Sunday school class. And if it's not ready, somebody's going to knock on the door, and then we'll get that envelope, and then we take it to the office. And that's what Miss Alma did. She, she got all the envelopes for everybody that was in Sunday school, and for over 30 years, she'd check boxes. She'd go down, take in the roll, and she'd check box. Who was present? Who was present? Well, some, a new minister came to the church, and he thought, she's been doing that over 30 years. She's in her 90s. How boring, how mundane... Can that be? And then he was converted. He talked to Miss Alma about it. She said, well, yeah, you know, when I go through and I'm checking the boxes every Sunday for over 30 years, I pray for that Sunday school member. For over 30 years, she'd been praying for every person who attended Sunday school at her church. The minister went to visit a teenager who was having her appendix taken out at the hospital and she was in there, and he, just, and he thought, well, you know, she's going to be real nervous. And she said to him, you know, I think I'm going to be fine because Miss Alma's praying for me. It seems like a little thing, but that's the kind of stuff that Jesus honors. That God recognizes as a tremendous contribution of our lives in the world. Jesus honors stuff like that. In the poem, Tourists, there's a guy who's taking a bunch of tourists around to Rome, and they're seeing all the incredible sights there of the great ancient Roman Empire. And they come to one building, and it's a, a wonderful arch, a Roman arch, and he's showing them the architecture, and he said, but look how beautiful that is. He says, not the arch. Go down and follow it, down to the left, the side. See that man leaning there with two grocery bags of vegetables and fruits that he has gone to the market to buy to provide for his family. That simple act of caring. Those are the things that God notices. Loving and caring for our families, our friends, for the least of these in this world. It's something that Jesus notices that we do. We, we may never get the chance to do something so big that we get an invitation to the White House. That somebody on the nightly news is going to interview us or they're going to build a monument to our lives. But every day, you and I get a chance to matter. 
Every day we get a chance to have a meaningful life by doing the small things that God notices. Things like praying for people, visiting them, writing them a card, smiling, being kind, offering a hand. You know, one of my favorite stories was a little boy who lived with his grandparents. I grew up with my grandparents for a while. And my granddad would always take me into school and pick me up afterwards. And in this story, this little boy was living with his grandparents, and every day after school, his granddaddy would walk him back the fairly short distance to his house. But his granddaddy died. And so he began that journey after school by himself. He'd walk back home by himself until one day a man from his church showed up, an older gentleman, and he said, I want to walk with you. And for a year, he met him after school every day. And he just walked with him. And this man sort of said, I see this as my ministry, to walk with people in their grief. Those are the kinds of things that God notices. And they count toward a meaningful life. Jesus said, I ask you simply to be light and salt. Shine some light in the darkness of somebody's life. Be salt that flavors with love this world and embrace it in my name. And you know, one of the great ways you and I can do that is by taking our own life experiences and being vulnerable and confessional enough to say, I open my life to be an avenue and a point of ministry for others. This is how someone once said it, and I like this. Be sure to make good use of your wounds. Everybody here has been hurt. In one way or the other, we've all suffered. We've had pain of loss or confusion or misunderstanding. We've had illnesses, difficulties. We've lost somebody that we loved and cared for. And those wounds, if we let them, can be a gift that God can use to touch someone's life. God can use your experiences to bless someone who is going through something similar to what you have been through. But we must be confessional, willing to open up our wounds, expose them for our friends, and allowing Jesus to use them. And then there's this. Throughout the Bible, God has given you and me a gracious invitation to be a partner with God in what happens in this world. In Matthew, Jesus says at the end of time, we're going to divide everybody into two groups, the sheep and the goats. And believe me, you want to be a sheep. And the group and the sheep, those people, he said, their hearts had been so transformed by God that they were doing the stuff that God considers meaningful in this world and makes you in the right group. They were feeding the hungry, they were giving water to the thirsty, clothing to those who were naked, and they were visiting those who were imprisoned or lonely. And I want to focus on that last part. I know missionally it's great and important that we do those material things, food, water, clothing, but what about presence? If you've ever been in love, you know how much you crave presence. You want to hold the hand of the person that you love. You want to embrace them. Jonathan's been off at college and he came back this week for spring break. He's a big old boy, but he knows that when he walks through that door, daddy's going to get him a big bear hug. And I am. I'm going to hug him and then boys know I'm a patter. I do that all the time because I want to embrace those boys because I love them. When Mary and I were dating, we were engaged and I was living in Louisville and she was living in Jack State going to school there. I called her before cell phones every day. She got a whole year's of seminary because I'd tell her about my day, everything I'd been doing, and I got a whole lot of education stuff, everything she was doing in her day during that time. But I wanted to be able, I couldn't physically be there, but the presence was so important to me. In our lives today, that's one of the greatest needs people have, the, the feeling that somebody cares enough to be there, to sit with you, to listen to you, to hold your hand, to have the presence to just be with you. That's a great need. And part of the presence is a great need of people who need uplifting. You know, we get so much negative, so many criticisms in our world today. You can turn on the news, on television, the radio. You can watch March Madness, and they're going to be criticizing college players for how they're playing. There's all that out there. There's so much negativity in the world, and it drags people down. And the world needs Christians, needs you, needs me 
to be an uplifting voice. You know the, the rule of the opposing thumb? If you've got some kind of criticism to offer somebody an opposing view, that's fine, but make sure you've got four non-opposing views. Four good, welcome, uplifting things you can say before the opposing thumb appears into that conversation. Listen, so many people in our world today, they hear in their ears and in their souls condemnation, judgment. They hear negativity all the time. The Bible says that God will not condemn us, but our own hearts do a great job of condemning us, doesn't it? And then we have the opponent of God who uses everything that he can to whisper into our souls and our lives, you don't matter, you have no meaning, you make no difference in the world. People need to hear the voice of God. And that voice will most often come from your mouth, from your lips, if you'll let it happen. One of my favorite preachers, John Claypool, said the way he sort of imagined this was that Jesus would come to him and say, look, I got laryngitis today. <laughs> so I'll give you everything you need to say, but I... I need you to say the words. I need you to speak it. Think about these first Christians. It was a motley group of folks. These earliest Christians came from all walks of life. There were slaves that got up early while it was still dark to go meet for church on Sunday. Beside rich people, poor people, men, women, boys, girls, Jews, Romans, soldiers. All this kind of group all mixed together to worship the living Lord Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and they kept dragging themselves to church because in church they got to hear the voice of God. In church they got to hear what they didn't get to hear out in the world. They got to hear the voice of God encouraging them, loving them, and telling them that no matter who you are, no matter what mistakes you've made, no matter where you come from, you matter to God. You have great value to God. One writer said, you know, we hear people say, you're just a drop in the bucket. You have no meaning in your life. And then she said, wait a minute. There's a bucket. And a bunch of raindrops together can fill up that bucket. Being a drop in the bucket can be magnificent. Our work is to help people see that there's a bucket. There are all these people all over the world who are contributing to this bucket of hope. And so our drops can be incredibly significant. You know, one of the greatest of the early Christians, who a lot of people don't know, was a guy named Barnabas. Barnabas was an incredible encourager. Barnabas was the guy who went and got Paul, the great missionary. Paul, Paul had been converted to Christ, had that vision on the Damascus Road, became a follower of Jesus, but he just disappeared for two years. Out in the Arabian desert, it was Barnabas who went and got him and encouraged him, and he went on the very first missionary journey. And on that first journey, there was this young guy named John Mark. And John Mark got homesick on the journey, and he abandoned the group. So the second journey comes up, and John Mark says, I want to go with you. And Paul says, no, you're a deserter, kid. I can't take a chance on you anymore. You know who did take a chance on him? Who said, I believe in you? Who encouraged John Mark? It was Barnabas. Barnabas encouraged John Mark. He went on another missionary journey. John Mark listens to the preaching of Peter in Rome and writes the first gospel we have. The gospel according to Mark. All because one guy decided to be a voice of God. To be an uplifter in this world. Who is it for you? Who do you know today that needs encouragement? Who is it for you that needs your voice, God's voice, through you to say, I believe in you? Who needs to be uplifted because of you? to hear that you can mean something in this world. You want to matter? You want to have meaning? And still hope in somebody's life. Be a cloud of witness to them. I have, I have no idea who Mary Godfrey was. She died in 1655 from a plague and is buried in this mass grave in the Bedlam Cemetery. Was she happy? Did she have green eyes? Only God knows, just as God knows you. And in the end, hopefully all of us can look back on our lives when we lie down at last and be satisfied. And we can rest in peace. 
because we have lived a life of meaning in this world. And we can believe that our lives mattered. I know this. Nothing we ever try for the sake of Jesus is ever taken for granted. My granddaddy, who most of you don't know, but I know it. My granddaddy used to always say to me, he'd quote this Bible verse, and he'd say, Mike, God notices you. God cares for you. He even has the hairs of your head all numbered. I had a whole lot of hair back then. God notices you. God cares for you. He has all the hairs of your head numbered because you are of great value to God. I believe Mary was of great value to God. You're of great value to God. Our lives have meaning. We matter to the eternal God who is. Amen. Hello, I'm Mike Oliver. I'm the senior pastor here at Trinity Baptist Church. I'd like to thank you for joining us for worship through our church website. And also, I'd like to invite you to come and visit us. This is a great church. We have friendly people here. We value worship. We value community and global missions. And there are programs for children all the way to senior adults. I think you'll like our church, and I hope you'll come and visit us and see for yourself in person. If you have questions about our church, like to know more, we'd love for you to contact us. There's information on our website. You can call us or email us or come by, and one of our staff members will be glad to talk with you. Welcome to Trinity, and God bless you and keep you.